Hi, and welcome to Healthy Living. I am here today with Kelly Presnell, Director of Public Relations and Marketing here at Hilton Head Hospital. And as always, you have a wonderful show mm -hmm. lined up for us today. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking about infectious disease, and I'm really excited about this because um, I know you're thrilled to have uh, the doc on staff here. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we have recently added two physicians who specialize in infectious disease, which is a subspecialty of internal medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just important to have that continuum of care within the hospital to, to help um, patients get out of the hospital sooner, quicker, faster, and to have that specialized knowledge with somebody with this particular area of expertise is... Great quality. It, yeah. Right. Great for, inpatient quality for, care. For our hospital. Right. So, um, and it's all based on community need. You know, that's when we bring physicians onto the, the medical staff is based on community need. And um, having this specialty, infectious disease, um, touches every aspect of care within the hospital, whether it's just pneumonia, um, a heart, you know, heart disease, diabetes. Um, they they focus on all areas, which is great for the rest of the medical staff that's here to have them as a resource. So on Healthy Living today, we're going to be talking to Dr. Ludwig Latai mm. about the infectious diseases. Stay with us. We'll be right back here on Healthy Living. We went to the emergency room and thank heavens we did. They discovered that I had two totally blocked arteries and I ended up having double bypass open heart surgery. Well, I stayed in the hospital for just a few nights. To the staff at Hilton Head Hospital, I would express the deepest gratitude that I possess. They literally, quite literally, saved my wife's life. We're here today on Healthy Living with Dr. Ludwig Letal. I love your name. It's beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. We've been chatting a bit before we actually started the taping. You have quite an interesting and diverse background. Um, I'd like to talk about that. First of all, um, as a doctor of infe infectious disease, I'd like to know a little bit about what that actually means. Uh, well, a doctor... Infectious disease specialist is someone who is trained in internal medicine but then went out beyond that for another two years of mm -hmm. uh, specialty training um, devoted to the di basically the diagnosis and treatment of infectious diseases. And that sort of summarizes what we do. In a nutshell. Well, we were talking again before that with some of the mainstream media, some of the movies out there, some of the books, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of mystique, if you will, about some of the infectious diseases out there. And I think one of the reasons that it's, it's great to actually talk to you is that you can demystify some of the things and chat a little bit, if you will, about how we are actually referred to you. How would we um, come to you? Well, we, uh, let me say that infectious diseases are so common that, um, you know, the vast majority of infections that people get are either you know, minor, maybe relatively minor and go away on themselves, or okay. they, their primary care doctor can take take care of them. We we tend to see, or most appropriately see, the more complicated infections uh, that are uh, don't, patients that have fevers that don't mm -hmm. respond to antibiotics. And the question is, is this you know what is this infection? Where what part of the body is it? You know, how do we? Um, so we, we you know we tend to see more problematic type pro, you know infections and. In general, uh, most of our outpatients uh, mm -hmm. are referred by other doctors. When I think of infectious diseases, or I, I guess when I think of the disease process, and help clarify this for me, I think of diseases of function, okay, like heart disease, diabetes, things like that, and then diseases of infection or mm -hmm. of microbes, if you will. Is, is that kind of what divides everything up? 
bacteria, viruses? Well, is that what yeah, we're talking we're, about? Yeah, a lot of doctors just deal with one organ system, whether that's heart or liver or, or kidneys. Uh, but infections can that involve any part of your body, mm -hmm. from the skin to the brain to you know the blood. And so we um, we deal more with infection as a as a problem rather than you know a certain part of the body. Is it a broad is infection a broad spectrum term that means what what you know we talk all the time oh it, that looks a little infected that's a little infected yeah. what does that really mean? Well, <laughs> it's um, I mean infection basically means that you've been contacted or invaded or um, affected by a, a microorganism, mm -hmm. whether it's a, you know, could be a virus, a, a, a bacteria, mm -hmm. a parasite, a fungus, a TB-like germ. Uh, there's a whole variety of, um, some are easy to diagnose and treat, others much more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem sometimes comes up where patients have a fever or they have an elevated white count or they have an area of inflammation on their mm -hmm. body or a swollen joint, and um, it doesn't respond to antibiotics, and sometimes it's, it's not an infection. I think that's one of the, another one of the roles that we play is that what, how to determine something is not infection or, or to withhold the antibiotics or to steer, you know, someone in the, in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Um, is, do you do that typically through elimination? Uh, it's, I, when I was reading a little bit about what in doctors of infectious diseases do, it's, it said that you're, you're very much a mystery solver. That's part of what you do. Well, that's, CSI that's is that. part, of, part of the appeal mm -hmm. to me of uh, infectious diseases that is somewhat of a, is an element of a detective story yeah. to it. You, you know, what is this infection? You know, where did the patient get it? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how was it transmitted? Um, that sort of thing. And then um, the other part of it that appeals to me is that you can usually treat it and mm -hmm. get rid of it. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's a happy, a happy yeah. ending yeah, to it. Yeah, exactly. So, whereas other doctors, um, oftentimes with kidney disease or, mm -hmm. or uh, heart disease, they can control the symptoms and get the patient better, but they, you know, unable to actually cure the patient. So. Doctor, when you talk about, you've talked a couple of times now about fever as being something that would be a specific reason someone would, call, would come to you. Um, I told you I have six grandchildren and, mm -hmm. and we are continuously dealing with you know fevers or rashes mm -hmm. or things like that. At what point during the different age groups do you seek um, someone of your specialty? And I know that, yeah. that the hospital is so excited to have you and feel very fortunate that you are on staff here. It, fevers can have tremendous variation in significance. I mean, mm -hmm. um, for example, children often have a high fever, you know, 103. Right. And without really much, you know, in the way of um, a serious infection, it's just a virus. So, can, can cause a high fever like that and mm -hmm. give the child the Motrin or something like that and the fever goes away and they look fine again. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, children are different uh, from that standpoint. They're different animals. They're different uh -huh. animals. Yeah. And, um, whereas in adults, uh, high fever, 103, 104, usually means some type of significant mm -hmm. infection. Um, although, actually it's also true, some of the highest fevers that you get are actually from heat stroke and uh, drug reactions uh, oh, that, that are actually not infections. Mm -hmm. So, fever alone again is not a um, you know an not indicator? the equivalent of an infection. Okay. I mean, there are certainly uh, cases that you know, and sometimes patients are getting this antibiotic and they keep getting fever and, and they, no one can figure it out. And it's actually the antibiotic that you know the drug that's causing the fever, and you stop the antibiotic, and within a day or two, it's all gone. So, oh, it's complicated. Yeah, well, that, that's that's kind of where, one of the things that we deal with. Yeah. We help sort out what what, uh, what why the problem isn't this is. working? Yeah, why, why is isn't this working? Right. Uh, yeah, is it the is the medication causing the problem, or or you know, do we need to switch to some other? And that's another difficulty or another reality is that oftentimes um, you have a, a like a pneumonia or something, and but you really don't know what the germ is. Okay. Um, it's actually true that uh, 80 to 90 percent of pneumonias get treated without knowing the specific bacteria. We sort of know, and 
and we can make a good estimate of what type of antibiotics right. will, will help. work. And, uh -huh. But as far as knowing the exact germ, I mean, we you know we don't often usually don't. But it, you know either the, uh, either patients get better on their own or right. or the uh, the antibiotics work. And so. please bear with me as far as and I think many of us have have the same opinion of not really understanding a lot about you know, what a virus really does, what a bacteria really does, how is that different than a fungus? Why do we have to worry? Is, is our body um, built to fight these things off? And is it because we, there's a vulnerability that we get sick with this disease? I know you tra you've mm -hmm. traveled extensively and we were gonna talk a little bit about your background. What did you see in different countries that you were, that you visited? You did mission work. Yeah. I just give one, you like 16 <laughs> questions rolled into one. Yeah. <laughs> what did I, um, I tend to focus on the last question. There you go. But, but, what, what did I see in, the, in those countries? Yeah, that might be different than what you would see from an infectious point of view than here in, in the oh. States. Actually, when I was a mission doctor in, in Malawi, this was back in the 70, late 70s, uh, we saw a lot of leprosy there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's very interesting. It's actually... There's a lot of misconceptions about leprosy. It's actually one of the least contagious of all diseases. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would, you know, see these patients. I would, you know, wouldn't get on a gown or glove or right. really anything uh, because it wasn't necessary. Um, but leprosy is very interesting. It's very, uh, it's actually, it's interesting. It's actually um, uh, there were experiments in leprosy in this country and. Not experiments, but ex ex uh, animal studies. And right. The, the animals that they looked at were armadillos, and uh, armadillos is one of the uh, uh, one of the few animals that are susceptible to leprosy. To leprosy. And and some of these escaped, and there's now leprosy in the armadillo population in the south of the U.S. Is there really? Yeah. It's so. And now, would that would that be transferable to humans? Um, Good question. It, it can be. Mm -hmm. um, it generally requires, you know, someone to, you know, cut up a carcass or, or mm -hmm. eat, a lup, eat, a eat an armadillo. Or, and, are and we? There's actually been cases like that that have occurred. Are we vaccinated for leprosy? No, we don't need to be. Okay. Um, it's um, like I said. It's a very. Uh, there's very little of it in this country, and and um, it's not it's like. Easily, even from armadillos, it's not easy. Right, you, even from the darn armadillo. armadillo. Yeah, you, exactly. You know, you toss it in the bushes, you don't have to worry about it. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk more about infectious diseases. And I have a feeling this might be something that we need to do two or three shows on because we've got a lot of questions for you. Stay with right. us. We'll be right back. We were outside after dinner, Mary Grace was riding her bike and heard a scream that no mother wants to hear. We took her immediately to Coastal Carolina. We could not believe it was a broken jaw. They are gifted to do what they do. And they are there for the community. And as a member of the community, I will be forever grateful. Hilton Head Regional Medical Center is located at 25 Hospital Center Boulevard. When traveling east on William Hilton Parkway, make a left-hand turn on Beach City Road, and the next left, Hospital Center Boulevard, will be located just past the Hilton Head Library. Coastal Carolina Hospital is located on US 278 at Exit 8 on I-95. Telephone is 843-784-8000 on the web www.coastalhospital.com. We went to the emergency room and thank heavens we did. They discovered that I had two totally blocked arteries and I ended up having double bypass open heart surgery. Well, I stayed in the hospital for just a few nights. To the staff at Hilton Head Hospital, I would express the deepest gratitude that I possess. 
They literally, quite literally, saved my wife's life. We are back here on Healthy Living. Again, we're here with Dr. Ludwig Latal. I love your name, it's, I'm, and I'm getting it now. I really am. We're talking about infectious diseases. In the first segment, we talked a little bit about um, uh, infectious disease basics, if you will. And then we sort of got went all around and talking about, I know you've done some mission trips, but let's begin with a bit of your background since we, we tantalized everyone with um, our discussion. Uh, well, I went you know, through my four years of college right. and uh, four years of medical school in Wisconsin. And then uh, I had two years, a year of internship, and then I did some tropical medicine training mm -hmm. um, in London uh, in the tropical medical school, and then late. I'm I'm a little unusual. I've done some of these extra things. Most mm -hmm. most doctors, you know, go through college and residency training and then specialty training and go into practice. But uh, but I had a lot of other experiences. I've done public health school for a year. I was an epidemiologist mm -hmm. for the CDC in Atlanta. For but that would seem to give you a lot of. Um Breath and depth, as far as knowledge base, experience, looking for the I unexpected. Think so. I, I mean, think so. Um, it's I, I have a lot of interest in public health, and mm -hmm. I'm one that you know is more likely to, you know, sort of, you know, well, what, you know, where did this infection come from? This salmonella, you know, we need to report that to the health department. And, mm -hmm. and when you try hear, to, go ahead. You know, try to help the health department out if by, you know, reporting, you know, diseases appropriately and problems that come up that may be more of a community-wide problem. Based on your experience, are we good consumers? Are we good at um, hand, we've done hand washing shows here, are we mm -hmm. good at protecting ourselves? Because I, I, what made me, after you said that, it's it's the cantaloupe um, that has the, um, list, what is listeria now? Oh, uh, listeria. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think most people with common sense and good hygiene, you know, you know reasonable hygiene practices, or you know, will will should be fine. I mean, okay. it's always um, like we sometimes tell travelers to foreign countries: you can you can do everything right and still get sick, and everything true. wrong and not, and get, not sick. get sick. Sometimes That's it's true. Just kind of the luck or bad luck, and you know, of, um, happening to eat some mm -hmm. fruit that's you know normally tainted or yeah you know, contaminated. Well, and, and the other thing is, you know, Kelly, you've got a two, two and a half year old. We got two and a half year olds. I've got grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Are are do we build up immunities um, to certain things, and then when when like my grandkids are exposed to totally different things than I was, or than my children were, would that would make us a little bit more susceptible? Are we more susceptible to things as we get older when it comes to um, bacteria, viruses? Well, I think. Um I wouldn't say, as you get older, you're not really more susceptible unless you start getting some other diseases okay. that, that compromise your immune system. I mean, it's true that aging, you know, when I say aging, I mean, uh, 60, 70, 80, mm -hmm. uh, that by itself can weaken the immune system. Then you get a little more susceptibility uh, or more serious consequences of influenza or certain types mm -hmm. of pneumonia. Um, but for the most part, healthy adults uh, who are otherwise healthy or not particularly at risk. I mean, there's always germs and pathogens out there that can make anyone sick, uh, but many of them are probably we, um, you know, get exposed to quite frequently and never turn a hair. I mean, to use the example of listeria, which was recently in the cantaloupe uh, contamination problem, listeria is a, a bacteria that normally you know, it really only affects people with very weak immune systems okay. uh, or pregnancy. It's another pregnancy vulnerable. is uh, a, a vulnerability based mm -hmm. on the immune system is weaker be to prevent rejection of the, the baby in the womb. Uh, they, pregnant patients and people with transplant or cancer patients can get big problems with listeria, but most healthy adults um, generally would not. I mean, even, oh, interesting. Um, might make you a little sick, but not really of any consequence. You probably wouldn't even notice that you'd had it. So, 
So that, that's part of the interest of infectious disease is that... Um, when I think of also infectious disease, I think of um, HIV. I think of things that, again, have been in the media that we've been exposed to. In the southeast population, what are mm -hmm. some of the things that you... Are you seeing a lot of pneumonias? Obviously, it's flu season, so I'm sure that we're getting our flu shots already, probably. Yeah. Well, uh, influenza and HIV are really not unique mm -hmm. to the south. Okay, that's fair. Means. Mm -hmm. it's, in the southeast, HIV is a, is a big problem. It's becoming more of a problem in kind of rural, uh, rural uh, communities, rural or, communities uh -huh. uh, less educated that um, don't seek care, or, mm -hmm. or you know, or do, you know, if they seek, are able to get care, they don't have consistent care, or they don't take the medicines. That's kind of where the, the that HIV is heading. We have we have other. We have Rocky Mountain spotted fever here. We have oh, Rocky Mountain spotted tick fever. related infections. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing we don't have in South Carolina that's always a source of confusion is, is Lyme disease. Okay, I was just um, going to ask you about that. It's is there such a thing? Well, there's plenty of Lyme disease, uh -huh. but it really it's mostly sort of Virginia and northward. So, and the source of confusion sometimes is actually a tick and tick bite that can cause kind of a round rash. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. That's um, that never goes on to anything else. But okay. People look at it and say, "Well, that must be Lyme disease." And and um, but if you actually test them, you know, they do blood tests. They don't have Lyme disease. It's another another virus that we haven't hasn't quite been identified. Cat scratch fever. Um, <laughs> cat scratch fever is. Uh, I don't know. I I was just. You it, know. It's um. It's another interesting infection. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of fun stuff, of isn't it? Yeah. That you come in contact with animals and. Um, oh, like, I don't want to hear know, that. La, 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 la. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have people, oftentimes those are farm animals or wild animals. I mean, there, there's not, there's a few things you can catch from your pets, but I, um, uh, you know, I have a the question. benefits of pets out far outweigh. Oh, I agree with that. I have a question for you. Yeah. Do many of us know how long it's been since we've had our last tetanus shot? And is that something to really consider? I was telling someone I was going to be interviewing you today, mm -hmm. and they were like, have you had your tetanus shot in the past 10 years? I'm like, I haven't even thought yeah. about it. Um, well, tetanus is, a, is something, it's a, the bacteria is called Clostridium tetani, and it's actually in dirt and soil. Okay. And it's in it's you know, everywhere. Kind of everywhere. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and tetanus, if, it, if that, you know, if you get, you know, the sort of most tetanus prone wound, if you step on a nail right, in a barnyard. Right, if, if I have a rusty nail. If I step on a nut, rusty nail in a barnyard, uh -huh. I mean, that would inoculate this germ up into the wound, oh. and there it would start uh, growing and producing uh, tetanus toxin, which okay. then cause, can cause tetanus, the clinical tetanus. Uh, most of us are, have had enough shots over the years that it's not going to happen. Okay. In my 20 years in South Carolina, I've seen one, one case of tetanus, and uh, there's an older woman, uh, she must not have almost ever been vaccinated, mm -hmm. but there's no question that's what she had. And uh, she, she did all right. She, she was on the ventilator for a while. And mm -hmm. to, and you love what you do, don't you? Well, it's it's a huge variety of interesting, you know, problems. Phenomenal. And, and things change. I mean, one of the things that are changing the most is that we're now seeing all these drug-resistant germs that are mm -hmm. um, becoming more difficult and more... Uh, um, not necessarily more pathogenic, but more you know, harder to treat, mm -hmm. and uh, that's kind of been kind of an evolving problem. That's so yeah, really, most people don't need to worry about that right. coming into contact with, you know, highly resistant bacteria. It's really more of a problem for patients in hospitals. So that what most people so encounter probably nowadays is this MRSA. Yes, um, the MRSA virus. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah lots of bacteria. It's, okay. MRSA is an acronym, stands for methicillin resistant staph aureus. It's okay. basically a staph infection that is a little more resistant, and, but we still have plenty bacteria. of antibodies to treat it with. I'll tell you what, this has been fascinating. Like I said, you might have to come back and, well, because I think yeah. each each thing that you talk about is really worthy of a discussion. We basically just sort of touched the tip of the iceberg for this. But we do appreciate you coming. We thank you all okay. for joining us here on Healthy Living, and we will get you back. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Okay.